So first, uh, just to introduce myself, uh, Ben Yoskovich. There's my Twitter handle. Uh, my contact information is on subsequent slides. I am primarily a product person um, and an entrepreneur. I started my first company in 1996, so 20 years ago. It's been a while. Uh, I've started a couple of companies. Uh, one was in the recruitment space. One was a services business. One was a startup accelerator based in Montreal called Year One Labs. Uh, also an author, of course, Lean Analytics. Uh, some of you may have read that, and I appreciate that if you have, and hopefully that was helpful. Also an angel investor. Uh, I've invested in 16 startups. Uh, B2B, B2C kind of runs the gamut. This is where you can find me online. That is my blog. Uh, a lot of Lean Analytics stuff on SlideShare, so you, know, you can certainly go and take a look at that content. Today is not a lot on analytics. Uh, a little bit more of an overview of some thoughts on product, but you can certainly go slide share and, and take a look at that. There's the book, there's my email address. By all means, email me at any time. Uh, uh, Michael mentioned Highline Beta, so this is <coughs> excuse me, a new company uh, that I started uh, with a co-founder, Marcus Daniels. Highline Beta is a startup co-creation company. Uh, and so what that means is that we work with large companies we identify areas of opportunity and growth and disruption, uh, and we look for those opportunities that we believe um, can be uh, benefit from the creation of new startups. And so we work with big companies, we look for these opportunities, we look for these areas of growth and disruption, and when we find one that we think warrants creating a new company, we will recruit founders, we will invest in those founders, and help them launch a new company. Um, so we are both a fund of sorts, not a venture fund, a typical venture fund, but we are an investment firm with a model that tries to combine corporates and startups, ultimately to create better startups. If you've ever worked, um, well, in a startup, if you've ever worked certainly in the B2B space, uh, but this applies in the consumer space as well, a lot of startups really start to get traction and take off when they get that first customer or that first partner. And our job is to try to accelerate those relationships uh, and build better companies. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but you can take a look at uh, Highline Beta if you're interested. Happy to talk about that later. Um, I want to just show, hopefully everybody can see this, and hopefully this works. I saw this a few weeks ago, um, and someone in the audience has seen this before, so she's laughing. Um, but I, I want to, let's see if this, if this plays. How long did it take? Okay, so just, this takes about a minute. Just watch this if you can see it. I did not make this, by the way. I just found it on Facebook. <laughs> okay, so how many people have ever felt a little, I'm not going to ask anybody if, if people have taken heroin before, but, but how many people have felt like that, sort of ever had that experience in product management? Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. It's kind of like that, and I think that's um, both the challenge and the opportunity with product management is how do we not make it so awful on that side. Um, I like Josh Elman's definition of a product manager. Uh, the job of a product manager is to help your team and company ship the right product to your users. Josh is a, a pretty successful VC um, from a company called Greylock in the Valley. So I, I like that definition because to me it's helping your team, it's a facilitator. I think of a product manager as the glue between all the people, right? The one that greases the wheels, not the person doing the bulk of the work, the person facilitating other people to get work done. Um, you're, this might be difficult to see, but I quite like this, um, this fellow by the name of Roman Pitchler, uh, actually has a pretty good book, 
Uh, and, and this is his uh, product management framework. You may not be able to see all of the stuff on the slide. And, and these slides or versions of these are, are online. But I really like this, and, and I like it because it, it shows um, the complexity of building products. And, and this is the role or the framework for product management, but it's not just the role for a product manager. So as you look at some of the stuff going on here, like general market knowledge on the side, or development and technologies over here, sales and support, these are all the things that it takes to build good products. The product manager is involved in all of these, but so are many other groups of people within your companies. Design plays a big role in a bunch of these. Uh, development certainly plays a role. Executives, depends on the size of the company, right? But there's lots of pieces to this puzzle to build better products, and product management is sort of facilitating all of this work. And that's part of why I think the previous slide is both funny but also pretty real, because it's actually pretty complicated. Um, so I think there's three things we need to build better products. One is a shared vision within our organization. One is process, which we can, we'll talk about. And the third is a common language that everybody speaks. I don't mean English or French or anything else. I mean a, a common language using data is what we'll talk about, right? So that we can translate things to other departments and other people and we understand it. Um, so first let's talk about vision. And, and I think this is really important. And maybe it's not surprising to me anymore um, but think about it within your own companies. But a lot of companies don't actually have a real vision for what they're doing. Uh, I would almost argue it's not even clear in some cases. It's true of startups and of big companies what their purpose even is, other than to you know build a widget and sell a widget and make money. Uh, and I'm not sure that's enough in the grand scheme of things to really motivate and incent people to uh, do great work and ultimately build great products. I, this is a quote from George Harrison. If you don't know where you're going, any road will take you. And, and for me, what this means is that if we don't have a shared vision for what we're trying to accomplish, people are running all over the place, right? And we're not aligned, and we can't get the key alignment we need to help people focus on what actually matters. Let me give you a, a sort of tactical way I think about this. So all of you, if you're all product people or design people or even engineers, uh, we have to spend a significant amount of time collecting input. Right? What are we going to build? Well, let's collect input. We collect it from customers. We collect it from all variety of sources. And <coughs> excuse me, all of that is wrapped by our vision. It is a massive and important filter we have to use for helping us make decisions on what's right and what's wrong. So for example, here I have product and design in the middle. right? And I have inputs coming in from users, customer feedback through in-person interviews, surveys, customer support. So I have all this input coming into product and design, and then I have all these other inputs, my own ideas, because I think my ideas are awesome, sales, marketing, customer support. All of these people are providing input. And all of that is going into product, and I've, I've bunched design in there as well, so product designers, um, to help us define goals and objectives for things that we're gonna build. All of that, thinking about vision, is wrapped in vision. And then there's two other things we have to think about here. One is we're filtering all of this input by our gut first. Happy to talk about that more. We can't ignore our own gut and our own instincts. And then that's supported by data. So this is A, a framework for thinking about how we collect input, but really the key thing for me here is that vision absolutely matters to helping us decide what we should build and why we build things and helping us to build better products. All right, number two is process. So, uh, how many people have read Lean Startup? Most of you, right? So I don't want to talk a lot about Lean Startup today, but I think that part of the reason why Lean Startup is so popular is because it, it gave us a, 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 a simpler process or helped us clarify how we could actually do things in a more methodical and logical way. I think that's one of the big reasons why Lean Startup has become so popular. And I think this is the key message for me, uh, is we have to stop building things nobody wants. At the end of the day, if we want to boil Lean Startup down, it's please stop building things nobody wants. Uh, and I'm not suggesting anybody in this room is doing that, it's everybody else that's doing that. Right? <laughs> um, we're all killing it, everybody else is, is uh, I'm, I'm on tape, uh, messing it up, is what we'll say, how about that? Um, so, everybody's familiar with this, or, or you know, most of you are familiar with the core concept of Lean Startup, this cycle of build, measure, learn. Right? This is the process by which we build something, we measure, and we learn. And I love it because it's so simple, there aren't that many steps, it's elegant, 
But if you've ever tried to implement Lean Startup within your organization, it's actually really hard to do. Uh, and it really actually starts to break down on the measure and the learn parts, right? Most of us are pretty good at the build part. Most, uh, if we go back to ideas, most of us are pretty good at the ideas, building stuff, pretty good at that. Most of us have a, a pretty good sense of what a minimum viable product is now. It's really on measure and learn when this falls apart. But this is the beginning of, of a process for helping us. Um, so I think, just as a quick aside, I am not a zealot when it comes to process, methodologies. I'll show you some examples of roadmaps and, and feature. Pro I'm not a zealot on any of these things. It's really just to get us thinking about how to do it better and get everybody within the organization aligned on things. All right, so let's talk about process. Uh, Product roadmaps, feature prioritization, and scope definition. Just the sort of three basics uh, that I want to touch on. For me, these are the three things that a product roadmap has to address. Where we're going, which is our vision. Why are we going there, which are the business values, uh, excuse me, the business goals or the value creation that we expect. And how are we going to do it, which is really the like brass tacks of resources and planning. Right? That's the nuts and bolts stuff. But the, the where are we going, again, that vision piece, really important. Otherwise, the roadmap, not super effective. Here's some best practices that I think about when I think about building roadmaps. We have to focus on goals and outcomes, not features. Right? A roadmap is not written stone. It's not this exact little feature. We're building it exactly this way. A roadmap is a higher level document. Um, I'd like to categorize it and organize it by themes. We'd like to make sure that problems are clearly defined and understood, right? What problem are we actually solving? We need to get aligned around problems, not aligned around, certainly not features, but not even solutions. We need to have a roadmap that's aligned around problems we're solving. I think a roadmap, the timelines are loose at best. This is not sprint planning. This is what are we doing in the next quarter? What are we doing, in, depending on the size of the company, what are we doing next month? What are we thinking about doing? It's about starting a conversation and getting people aligned around things not about the weeds. We're not in the weeds yet. Um, I'm going to use Roman Pitchler's uh, Go product roadmap as a pretty good example of this. Um, and hopefully you guys can see this in the back. It, it's reasonably clear. It's kind of a one, you know, everything for me is like a one page, by the way. I just like, everything should be describable. The whole business should be describable in one page. But I like his framework here because it blends a high level roadmap and a little bit of release plan. Like, we have to ultimately release stuff, so we can't live in the weeds, like, can't live high level forever. We have to, at some point, release things and plan them and, and do that. I'm just going to assume we're all reasonably capable at that side of things. Um, but I like this. So, you know, there's a date of some variety. There's a name, which is really the theme. Uh, the goal is the, is the most interesting thing here for me. That high level purpose of what are we actually doing? And, you know, in Lean Analytics, we talk about different stages like stickiness and virality, or um, R stands for pirate metrics, if you're familiar with that. This is just about what are we actually trying to accomplish here? We can list some of those features and ultimately, and also some of the metrics, like what are the goals we're trying to actually hit here? And this roadmap leads to things like epics and stories and specs and MVPs, right? Depending on agile, again, agile, not whatever, right? But the goal here is anybody who looks at this within the whole company, anybody, it doesn't matter if they're a product person, design person, even if sales, marketing, should be able to say, got it, I understand roughly when we're aiming for things, I understand what the theme of this is, I understand what the goals are and why we're trying to achieve this, high level I understand what those features are. So to me that's an effective roadmap. All right. By the way, I have no idea how we're going to be doing on time here, so I'm just going to talk. I'm going to talk really quickly, and then somebody will tell me to stop talking. <laughs> or I'll, end up, I'll run out of things to say. Okay, so that's a road, high-level roadmap, goal-oriented, wrapped in vision. That's what I want us to think about when we think about roadmaps. Then we have to get you know, one level deep, uh, deeper. The next level is feature prioritization. And for me, feature prioritization is about focusing on value creation. Uh, so again, we want to start with those goals and those outcomes with some amount of metrics of how we're going to measure things um, in our feature prioritization. Then we want to rank order the solutions or features based on how we're measuring value creation. And I wrote here, identify a line in the sand. And we're not going to talk uh, about that really today. But ultimately, what we're saying is if we're trying to move a specific metric, we need a target for that metric. Otherwise, we don't know if we Right? So we have to come up with goals that we're trying to actually hit. 
Um, so we want to rank order these solutions or features, and then we want to rank order the solution um, based on value creation. What is our estimate of value creation? And then we want to rank order these solutions based on effort, right? Because we may have high value, high effort. Ideally, we're looking for high value, low effort, right? That's ultimately what we're trying to come to is what will give us the most value for the least amount of effort. And to some degree, effort, I would also um, put in there risk, right? There's always, a, there's always a risk factor here of not being able to do it, technical, whatever the case may be. Um, so we have to sort of balance those things. Uh, so one example of that is Intercom's rice model. Has, have people seen this before? Yes, no, some people. Uh, so this is just their um, methodology for doing feature prioritization. It's not the only way to do it, but again, we're trying to rank, we have a list of things we want to do. We have a roadmap, tells us this is the goal we want to get to. We have a list of possible features. How do we decide which ones to build? Let's rank them by value versus effort. Um, and the way that they do this is with, you know, cute acronym called RICE. Everything has to be an acronym, by the way, or a framework. Uh, so reach, how many people will be impacted by the new feature over a given period of time? Impact, how much will this new feature impact an individual user or customer? Confidence, how confident are we in our estimates? So that's a little bit of that risk factor uh, baked in there. Excuse me. And then effort, how much time will it take to deliver this new feature? Uh, and so it works like this. Reach, time, if you can see that on that lousy green, reach times impact times confidence uh, over effort equals your rice score. So if we can quantify our feature prioritization, and this is not perfect math, there's obviously a judgment in here. All through here, there's judgment, right? Ah, oh, reach, I don't know, like, I think it'll be like this. But at least it's consistent for judgment, if that's the way it is, right? <laughs> at least that those variables are reasonably controlled. And this gives you some indication of least amount of effort, most amount of value, right? That's what you're looking for. This is not a perfect scientific way of approaching feature prioritization, but it's a lot better than guessing. Or having too much influence from outside um, elements, extra other departments, sales, whatever it is, having too much of an influence without saying, great, we're going to assess this for something like rice. Uh, right? Okay. A couple of other things that I wanted to mention when I think about feature prioritization. So one is, it, when I think about value creation, uh, I think about um, this idea of tiny new addictive behaviors, uh, which I wrote a blog post about. Addictive, maybe not the best word. Because um, it has a, a negative, can have a negative connotation. Um, but everybody, or, or many of you, are, should be familiar with Pavlov's dog, right? Uh, ring a bell, salivates, is food. So I think, when I think about what features we should build from a value creation perspective, I'm thinking about how we're driving this type of behavior for users, right? I want a user to do something, I want them to get some value out of that, I want them to get rewarded, and then they do it again. Right? And I want them to keep doing it and doing it and doing it over and over again. Um, ultimately, what we're looking for most of the time when we build features is engagement. We're looking for some amount of usage and stickiness, which then is a proxy of value creation over time. And so I really think about how do these features that we're building drive the kinds of loops that we actually want inside of our product. Um, so a more elegant way of describing that is the hook block. Uh, how many people are familiar with the hook model? Okay, great. Um, and so, uh, this is a great book, by the way, and, and it's a fairly simple model, so it's a more elegant way of describing it. There's a trigger, there's an action, there's a reward, and there's an investment. So there's a trigger, either an internal or external trigger that says, oh, I gotta go do this thing, right? Every time something happens, I gotta go do this thing, I know I need to take that action. Um, that leads to the action of what's that simplest behavior, that I'm gonna do in anticipation of a reward, then I'm gonna get my reward, and in the book they talk about variable rewards. If I get the same reward over and over and over again, unlike the dog one, um, it diminishes the value, and then that drives an investment of a little bit more work. And, and, I, and then I keep going and going and going. Um, here's an example, the Pinterest hook. This is for new users on Pinterest, not expert users. So there's an external trigger, Facebook, Twitter, or word of mouth. I, I, I see something, I hear about Pinterest, I go in. What's the first action on Pinterest? Scrolling. Endless scrolling. Endless scrolling through pictures and pictures and pictures. 
Uh, the reward is I'm discovering interesting objects. And that's variable because I don't know how quickly, I'll, I'll, how many of them, but there's some hunt there and some excitement for um, finding interesting objects on Pinterest. And then the investment is repinning, following, or commenting. And then I do that, I get, and then that reminds me to go and do the behavior again. And so when you think about what features you're building, you want to think about them in loops. I need people to do this. When they do this, they're going to get some kind of benefit from that. That's going to trigger them to do a little bit more work, and that's going to remind them that every time this happens, I want them to go do this thing. And then they just come through the loop over and over and over again. And really, um, when we look at most startups, or, more, or excuse me, most new products, they fail at what I would call the stickiness phase in lean analytics. At engagement, they actually fail. Um, they may not technically have failed at that point, like they may continue and raise more capital and grow and whatever, but they've actually failed because they haven't come up with a core loop or multiple loops that drive the kind of engagement that they really want, uh, or frankly, that they really need to create value. All right, so that's sort of quickly about how I think about uh, feature prioritization. Um, then I think about defining scope. So we have a roadmap, we do some analysis, um, Incidentally, analysis that we can share with the whole company. I think it's really important that we're, as product people, as transparent as we can possibly be. So everybody's like, how are you assessing features? Here's how I'm assessing them. Now we can argue about the details, but this is the formula we use for measuring what we should build. And then we have to get into defining scope. And for me, again, I think about this like a one-page scope document. In Agile, maybe this is an epic. Again, I you know, want to stay out of the sort of specifics of methodologies. But for me, this is about saying, we've got our features, we've got a roadmap, we have our features prioritized, we now have to decide what the hell those features actually are and what we're actually building. Um, and so, what are we building? We've got to define that minimum viable product. And again, we're thinking about user flows here. How is a user coming in? What are they doing? What reward are they getting? And is that enough to incent them to do the actions that we want them to do over and over again? We have to think about who's going to work on this now, who the key stakeholders are within the organization. We have to understand and be clear about why we're building something. Um, so I'm really, I think a lot of times we skip this step on that, that true problem identification and validation. We sort of say, oh, somebody told us this is a problem, let's just go build it, because building things is, relatively speaking, easy to do. So we'll just add more features, which is, in the history of features, I'm not sure ever the answer to anything. Uh, so, why are we building it? Do we really understand it? Does everybody understand within the organization? Not just the product person, not just the engineers, not just the designers, but the whole company. Does it, not that everybody has to understand, care about every feature being built, but they have to have a mechanism that they can go in and say, got it, you're trying to solve this problem. Uh, we have to have our assumptions and our hypotheses in that scope document. We have to understand the risks that exist Let's be transparent about what risks may exist, where how could this thing actually fail? And we have to understand what our success criteria are. So we have a one-page scope document that says, this is what we're building, this is how a user, we want them to behave, this is who's gonna work on it, this is who cares, this is why we're doing it, here are the risks and assumptions we have, and here's the metrics or the success criteria. And this should generally be able to fit on one page. And then this is the page that says, this is what we're doing. And so if we're building whatever the number is, five features in this sprint or in this, for this roadmap, we've got five scope documents. Oh, and I, I forgot the last point, future feature ideas. Everybody loves this one, right? Because everybody, what do, what do we all want to do with features? We want to make them bigger, right? Who doesn't want to make features bigger and add more stuff into them? Everybody universally wants to do that. So I think we have to admit that reality and we have to engage our counterparts inside the organization around that. Like, we're gonna build something really tiny as an MVP to test it, and everybody, yeah, build more, build more, build. Okay, you know what, we'll leave a little section at the bottom of this document for future feature ideas. So we can capture those things, which is interesting, but also so we can make sure that they, people recognize when they're throwing stuff at you, that we've listened to them, and we've done some kind of documentation around that. Right, so this is where we're gonna build first, Maybe later we'll get to this. All right, so how does this all come together um, super quickly? Um, so again, 
everything for me is wrapped in a company vision. And I, I stress this a lot because I really, really feel like if you're working at a company today and you don't know what that vision for that company is, then you're misaligned. And every, somebody, will, not today, but somebody almost always asks me, what do I do? How do I get my company to be more aligned and do things properly and be more data driven? And I'm like, you can try, and if it doesn't work, you find another company. So by the way, that's just the answer, is find another job. Okay, <laughs> so how does this all come together? So we have internal, external outputs coming into the organization. We have what I call perpetual problem and solution validation. So for me, the ideal scenario, before we even get to quarterly roadmaps, for example, right? Before we even get to defining a roadmap, we are doing what I would call perpetual problem and solution validation above that. Um, and when I was, I was doing a, um, a workshop with product designers specifically, my, my argument, if you will, was that this is a great thing for product designers to do because they can do so much stuff without code, without testing, right? Like the further down we get, the higher the risk if we've made a mistake, right? So if we can do perpetual problem and solution validation up here, constant experimentation, leveraging the talents of product designers in particular, then that's going to educate our roadmap more effectively. So by the time we get to our roadmap, we have a clearer sense of, again, remember, what problems are we trying to solve? Yeah, we're already experimenting with those up there based on inputs that are coming in. We have the little magical backlog, which we won't talk about today, it's so fun. I'm suggesting quarterly roadmaps. That goes to the project scope creation documents, right? Those one pagers, of which there are more. Um, and then that goes to, and I'm calling it sprints, right? And every company works a little bit differently. Two week sprints, three week, four week. Some are more agile than others. Some are uh, more religious about, about that than others. But at the end of the day, this is where the execution layer is, right? Everything above this is, is experimentation and strategy and thinking and planning. And by the time we get down to sprints, we should be in a position that we know exactly what we're building, we know why we're building it, we know how we're gonna measure it, and we, we, we're not gonna fuck up those sprints. We're not gonna interrupt them halfway through and be like, oh shit, we're I'm now in this one. You know, we're completely wrong, good God, what do we do? All the way back to the top. And so the way I visualize, and this is a simple visualization, but you see like there's arrows going back and forth between things like perpetual problem solution validation and quarterly roadmap. Right? Because we may start working on this roadmap and be like, wait a second, we're not really sure if this goal or this feature solves a real problem. Can we do some experimentation first before we go and just shove it down developers and de designers' throats and get them to work on it? Because by the time we get here, if we've made a mistake, the cost is really high. Right? And you know, after sprints, there's you know, QA and launch. And, and you know, launch is somewhere over here, and if we launch something that's wrong, it's really expensive, right? And, and buggy is one thing, but I'm talking about something that creates no value. And we just went through this whole process to get to the end, and we still made a mistake. So this is kind of the way I see building better products. If we can get those quality inputs coming in, assessing those through our guts and through data, do this experimentation as early and as constantly as we can, and then drive down so that sprints are just purely about execution. All right, so the last thing, so that's process. The last thing I wanted to talk about is a common language. And for me, this is about data. So I think of data as a lot of things, but I think about data, in the context of today anyway, and of building products as a communication tool. So tracking in specific metrics is great, knowing what we're tracking, knowing what our goals are is wonderful, but what you see inside of organizations, and maybe you, you, you've seen this in your own companies, is you might understand the data, your developers might, the product designers might, but other teams there that matter um, might not understand the data. Why are we tracking this? How are we measuring this? How do we know if it's creating value? I think data, if we can communicate it simply enough, to everybody is the common language that everybody understands. So uh, analytics is the measurement of movement towards business goals. So what? It, so there's you know, three words highlighted here. Those are the ones that matter, right? If we don't know what our goals are or what problems we're trying to solve, it doesn't matter what we track. It, it just makes no difference. And ultimately what we're trying to track here is progress or movement. 
not a single point in time. We're trying to actually track, are we getting towards our goals? Are we creating the value that we need to create for our users and customers? So, a couple of quick sort of lean analytics things. What makes a good metric? Think about this from a communication perspective, right? Think about how do I communicate as a product person, uh, which I'm making you know assumption everybody's a product person, but how do I communicate this as a product person to an executive? How do I communicate this to a VP of sales? How do I communicate this to developers or anybody else, right? So we need to have good, simple metrics. I mean, that's what lean analytics was basically all about. So there's four things. One is a good metric has to be understandable. We can track a whole bunch of stuff. We can make it super complicated. At the end of the day, how do we just create really simple numbers that everybody understands? A good metric has to be comparative. So I have a very simple example here active users versus active users per month. So if I tell you I have 100 active users, no idea if that's meaningful or not, right? Like, is that good, is that bad? Zero idea. If I told you I had 100 million active users, we could just assume that was good. But, you know, most of the time, it's like a number from one to not 100 million. So I have 100 active users, no idea if that's good or bad. If I told you that I have 1,000 active users and last month I had 100, that's a little bit better, right? That's a 10x increase in active users. So that starts to sound like I'm able to compare month over month um, a key metric that matters for my business. So a good metric is comparative. Usually we think about that over time. Um, even more important, I think, than that is a good metric is a ratio or a rate. So again, I had 100 active users last month. I have 1,000 active users this month. Last month, I had only 200 people sign up. So 50% of those people, and again, this is simple math, right? 50% of the people were active. This month, I have 1,000 active users. I had 100 million signups. So as a percent monthly active users compared to my signups, my number now is terrible. I did something horribly wrong, even though I 10 x my active users. So a good metric has to be a ratio or a rate. It's a percentage is what we're looking for. And finally, and I think most importantly, a good metric has to change your behavior. So uh, this, to me, I think is the most important thing when we think about how do we communicate simple metrics to people, it's this. If a metric won't change how you behave, it's a bad metric. And that doesn't mean we don't track a whole bunch of data. And there's lots of reasons to track lots of data, and I, I have examples of companies that track data and they're able to explore things and learn from that data. Super valuable. But right now, we need to focus on solving very specific problems. We can't do everything and we need to track numbers that actually will change our behavior and help us make better decisions. So if you're looking at a number right now, you know, think about your dashboard at, at your office, right? It's on the screen maybe like this. You know, these are the numbers on the dashboard. If you have a number on your dashboard and it's going up and you're like, I don't know what I do with that. It's going down, I don't know what I do with it. And that's not worth focusing on. You can track the data, that's fine. That's for different purposes. But we look for numbers that are changing our behavior. So Couple of other things. I talk a lot about quantitative data, um, but I'm a huge believer and fan of qualitative data as well. So for me, I think the lesson for me is this quantitative data tells us what is happening. We can see it, we can track people, we can look at their behavior. They're falling off the funnel, right? Onboarding funnel, look, they're dropping on step five. It doesn't tell me why. So qualitative data tells us why things are happening. And a lot of companies make this mistake where the minute, maybe not the minute, but very soon after they start tracking things, they stop talking to customers. And it's a huge mistake, right? We can talk for a, at length about the importance of how do we continue to talk to customers to understand the why. Because the what we can track, the why we can't. So for, for me, data is about, sim it's not just about visualizations, it's about simplifying the data so everybody understands it and understands why we're focusing on specific numbers. If we don't do that, this is what's going to happen. People are going to say, fuck you. I don't know. It's funny. I, I started out. I don't know why I did that. But uh, fuck you and your data. I don't believe you. So if you bring data to people and it's complicated and they don't understand what it means and they don't know what cohort analysis is or any of these things, they're just going to ignore the data because people want to believe that they're right. Everybody wants to believe they're right. We just, we're just built that way, most of us. And so executives or whatever it is will say, you know, I don't, I don't understand this data. It's too complicated for me. Why don't we just do what I said? Because I get paid the most money. So we're just going to do what I do, right? And we need to get away from that. 
So I think data is complex, but how we communicate it doesn't have to be. Um, and again, that's what Lean Analytics was all about, the book. If you've read it, um, fantastic. Um, what to focus on and when. And so one of the key um, elements of that is this idea of the one metric that matters. And so in the book, we talk about at any given point in time for your business, there's a single metric that matters that you can operate the whole company on. That can align everybody around, great, we know we're tracking this, we're tracking you know, some user retention number, we're tracking MRR, we're tracking a single individual number that tells us what stage we're at and what everybody in the company needs to be focused on. Um, now, the truth about, and, and, and I, I won't share um, some examples of this, there are companies that very clearly use the one metric that matters as a health indicator for the overall business. Clearly, we don't track a single number. But if we can focus on one key metric that everybody gets aligned around, then everybody is working to solve the same problems. And that's how we ultimately build better products. But I think about it a little bit like this. Oh, and that's, that's supposed to be red, by the way, those arrows. Do, that doesn't matter. But I think about the layer, I call it the layer cake of metrics. So clearly, we don't just scrap all our Google Analytics and all our data and throw it all in the garbage and just say, boom, one number, our dashboard's super simple, right? Uh, there's, there's some layers and complexity to this. So I think if we're working at the project level, we're building a feature, we have a metric that we're tracking that in that scope doc, in that roadmap that says this is what we're trying to accomplish. The problem is, if that doesn't level up to some departmental number or some higher level number, which then levels up to a business health indicator, then I don't know what we're doing down here. And I'm not suggesting that every little piece of work we do down here has some impact on some overall company-wide metric that matters, but at the end of the day, you know, how many times are we gonna work on projects down here and track things, and it has no impact on the business because we don't know what the goal of the overall business is or the vision, where it's like, why am I doing this work? So to me, metrics is about communication and about aligning everybody around what actually matters. Let me give you a quick case study and then, and then we're done. Hopefully we're okay on top of you. Yeah? No clue. So, anybody familiar with the company Proposify? A couple of people, oh, that's cool. Um, I'm on the board of uh, Proposify, uh, just as disclosure. Um, this is an example, uh, a very simple example of putting basic data to use. And uh, again, data is complicated, we can get into the weeds on it, but I really like this example because of how simple it is and how easily we can communicate the sort of logic of the steps that this product manager goes through to make decisions about what to build. So, Ricky is the product manager, that's his real name, uh, has some ideas for improving this screen, which is the proposal send screen. So, for those of you not familiar with Proposify, it's a uh, software as a service tool, primarily for um, uh, agencies to send proposals to customers. Uh, you know, send really beautiful proposals, organize them, construct them. It's not a sales pitch, but that's what they do. So, this is the screen where the guy sending the proposal says, "Great, I've got, I've written it, I've designed it. I'm going to hit the send button." And Ricky has some ideas, I don't actually know what they are, it doesn't really matter, based on his own gut, right, as a product manager, and qualitative feedback that he's gotten from customers to say, I think we can make some improvements to this screen. So, the, the stupid thing to do would say, fantastic, throw that on the roadmap, throw it into a sprint, shove it down the throats of the developers and designers, I know exactly what to do because I'm the, I'm the product manager. Ricky, go build this stuff, right? That would obviously be the wrong thing to do. So instead, Ricky, who's uh, smart, says, wait a second, I have some ideas, because I'm a product guy and I love ideas, I'm always thinking about stuff, but let me go look at the data. This is what he finds out. He finds out that 50% of people send proposals through Proposify, so they get to the screen and they send them, 50% don't. Now there are other ways of sending proposals. You can turn them into PDFs, you can turn them into other things and, and send them that way. So it's not that 50% of people are literally abandoning at this stage. So the question then is, he goes into his data, looks at it, and says, wait, 50% are sending through, 50% are not. The question is, is that good or bad? Anybody? Good or bad? Just yell, good, bad. Who thinks good? We don't know? We don't know, yeah. What is that, 50% of people who have Proposify? No, no, 50% of Proposify users who get to this, who, who uh, who use Proposify, send proposals through the system, 50% do not. They're all active customers. 
50% of active customers send proposals through Proposify, 50% do not. They design proposals through it, and then they send them as PDFs or something else. There's no fee for sending proposals. Nope. Yeah, it's a software as a service. It's a recruit. Yeah, so so that's exactly right. Somebody said we don't know. When I saw this, and he should, this was not a board meeting level discussion. This was just like I talked to him every couple of weeks. He's like, oh, I saw this thing, and I'm like, oh my god, that's terrible. Like that was because I'm an idiot. That was literally my first reaction. I was like, oh my god, 50% sent through, and 50. What the hell are those 50% doing? Like that sounds awful. Are they all churning? This is insane. So of course I panicked. Um, and he's like, well, I don't know if it's good or bad. Right? So now we have to go look at more data and, and, and understand this more deeply. And so he does what we would call sort of looking exploratory data. Let's dig into the data and look at it to try to understand what's going on. Most specifically, let's figure out if that proposal send rate um, through the system has an impact on a metric that actually matters to the company. Because we have no idea if that matters. These are two metrics that do matter. Churn is one. For any SaaS company, you're familiar, I mean, familiar with churn, pretty important. Proposal one rate is also important because one of the core value propositions of Proposify is that if you use our tool to send proposals, because they're so wonderful, you will win more business. That's core value proposition of what Proposify sells to customers. So if the 50% that send through the product are winning proposals like it's going out of style, and the 50% that aren't, aren't winning proposals, or the reverse, for all I know, that would be a huge issue. And so what they're looking for here are correlations. Correlations between proposal send rate through the system to a metric that actually matters. And, all, and, and what we're looking for ultimately is, hey, wait a second, this send rate actually matters for a metric that's really important, and these things are correlated. We don't know if they're causal, which means if we change this or get more people to send through the product or not, it will have an impact, but there's some relation there. Uh, so that would be the next step for Ricky is to go look at that. Even beyond that, the next step after that is to say, well, look, that's not enough. Like We're in the weeds now looking at the data and looking for correlations and trying try to figure out value, but we don't know where the value creation really lies. So what he has to do is more customer development. So it's back to lean startup. Like call your customers who send through the product and those who don't send through the product and ask them, what's going on? Have you ever tried sending through the product? Yes, no, why? You know, he has to go back and learn. And all of this homework is what I think about it. Like it's research that we're doing into our own operations may lead to um, meaningful product development, which turns all of that work um, into action. <clears throat> So, you know, it was first sort of, I have a gut instinct, qualitative information, my own ideas, feedback from customers. I look at the data, I see 50% sent through, 50 don't. That you know, sounds scary, but I don't know what it really means. I don't know if it's good or bad. I then have to go and dig into the data more to understand if that, you know, quality of customer, who's doing what. I have to get out of the data, talk to customers more to see if I can tie the what and the why together. And then I can make decisions on what to actually build from a feature perspective. And should I change this or not change it? So it's that process to me is just a, and this doesn't mean that this takes years to do, of course. This can be very fast. But it's a very good way of thinking about going from qualitative to quantitative back to qualitative. Uh, so for me, when I think about building better products, I think of product managers, if you will. We think about that Roman Pitcher sort of um, whole framework as detectives, as facilitators, and as communicators. Those are really the jobs of product people. We have to be detectives to identify problems that matter. We have to facilitate and make these things happen for all the people who do the work. Because let's face it, product people don't do actual work, right? We don't write lines of code. We don't design things. We get other people to do those things. And we have to be good communicators across, like up, managing up, and managing sideways. Um, and again, it's not just about hard data. I think about, we have to let our guts guide us, right? We have to not get caught in analysis paralysis. We have to be able to make judgment calls and decisions. And if anything, that's how product managers are not entirely judged on their judgment, not entirely judged on their ability to make those guesses, but we have to also be the decision makers 
and not just spend all our time in a process of analysis. Uh, and that's it, so thank you very much. Uh, we'll open the floor up to any, any questions or any, anything you guys want to discuss or chat about with Ben now. Anyone? Was it anything to do with the updates folder? Was it anything to do with the updates folder? Oh, I don't know what that. Uh, are you familiar with Proposify? You no, know, but I use Hello Sign, and I assume if you send it to Proposify, the proposal is going to end up in the updates folder instead of the inbox. Oh, maybe. I, I don't know. I, so I don't know the conclusion of the story. Okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll see. Yeah. So we're going to come in, I'd say, especially quite bad at utilizing data and like having good metrics and tracking the right things. So what advice would you give to someone like myself who's trying to influence that and get people to actually like move in that direction and become more metrics focused? I'm pretty sure I said get a new job. Did not yeah. say that? <laughs> I'm pretty, I'm, that's on tape too, so. Um, you know what, <laughs> yeah, so, so the short answer to that, I think, it, the short answer to that is to find so all of building better products is about finding the, the, the most important problems and solving those, right? Because th that's where we presumably are gonna create the most value. And sure, there's lots of feature optimization and stuff, right? But ultimately, building the best product means tackling the biggest problems, or identifying them and tackling them. And if your company doesn't believe in the use of data, going after those problems first will not work. Because people will have too many opinions, and it's too, um, it's too those, those things are too hot buttons. So my suggestion is you find smaller projects, smaller features, call them what you will. Um, side, pro side projects may be the wrong way to think of it. Like carve off some features and say, I'm gonna run these with a more of a data approach to them. And nobody cares about them, right? Or, or less people care about them. Like don't go after the big, you know, the big scary monsters. Go after the things on the side and prove that this methodology of using data in this case works and gets to better results and faster, and then say, you see, like I told you it would work, and then what they'll say is, yeah, that's great, whatever, we don't care, and then you get another job. But I, I, I think it's going after the small, try to go after smaller projects first to prove a methodology and an approach to things. Thanks. If you can. Yeah. Any other uh, questions? Sure. Uh, you, your example about using data to kind of figure out what to do next, um, for a product that was already there, so they actually had data on how yep. users all that kind of stuff. So, what is advice on somebody who's trying out a new, uh, wanting to develop a new product, and all that happens, talking to customers? Yep. So, when you start, um, it's all qualitative. It's all qualitative, uh, and and frankly, everybody starts there, right? Uh, even if you're building a new feature for an existing product, I would argue you're starting with qualitative. But so you're starting with qualitative uh, information. Um, it's very difficult to turn qualitative information into anything quantitative. So you know the, you're, you're leveraging your own instincts and your own ability to do successful problem interviews and solution interviews with, with users or, or potential users or potential customers, and your own ability to interpret that stuff to figure out should we build this thing or not. So over time, it will become more quantitative. And then it's about finding the right balance. But at the beginning, it's mostly qualitative. Now, there may be ways that you can uh, do experiments without building the real product. Like that's always a possibility. Uh, I, I can give a very, if we have time, I can give a very quick example. So there's a company that I invested in through um, a startup accelerator called um, Local Mind, which was ultimately acquired by Airbnb. And so Local Mind was a mobile app for asking people questions about uh, locations in real time. So, uh, you know, people might, you know, we're all here, we've checked in here, and on, like we're on local mind, we have the app, and people are asking questions like, how badly is that doing, right? Like, or, you know, is there a fire in the building, or what's traffic like, right? So it's about just real time Q&A about locations. And so, now, before they built this mobile app, right, which is expensive, Right, from a time perspective, like you know, they used Twitter as a proxy. So what they did was they said, okay, well look, people tweet, they geolocate their tweets. If we will randomly ask people questions based on their 
geolocated tweets. Let's see if they answer any questions. Because they believe that their biggest risk to this thing working was people would not answer questions. So if you, if you have a sense of what your biggest risk is, there may be a way of testing it. So we would be um, geolocated tweets in Times Square, and we would just be tweeting randomly, like, hey, what's the weather like there? Or what, you know, like, ridiculous things, to see if anybody would answer. And it's not a perfect experiment, right? But it, it costs nothing to do, and it's super fast. And it turns out a lot of people answered, some people were like, who the fuck are you? Of course, right? <laughs> but a high percentage of people answered the question, but like you would not believe it. They'd be like, oh, it's nice out there. Oh, yeah. Like, uh, you know, we would do things like, can you take a picture? Oh, yeah, sure. Do a tweet. Like, it's crazy, right? And we're like, great. We think that that's de it's not perfect de risking, but we think it's de risked enough to go build it. Now, the, the truth of, for local mind was the response rate was always high. So they were right. Nobody had any questions. So that was actually the biggest problem. So when you think about starting something new, feature or product or business, I think you have to figure out what the assumptions are. Try to rank those from like the scariest, like if these are wrong, the whole business is fails. And then what can I do to test those assumptions beyond just qualitative? What, it, what hacks or experiments can I Oh, but the answer with she has a lot, and that position a lot. Uh, is you don't have to rely just on yourself and what you get from your customers and prospects. There's often people that believe that you're other for you, other companies. Growth people won't tell you anything about how they acquire customers. Product managers about reaching decisions and about what customers actually use. But they're wealth of information. Your competitors will tell you everything that they've learned, about all the mistakes that they made um, along the way. And there's a lot of secondary research as well. Yep, yeah, for sure. From Nubia, from uh, ECI, program as well. Yep, absolutely. Cool. Good question. Any, any advice for teams or companies that have very few customers, so it's difficult for them to get a good quality statistical information on the very metrics? I think generally facing people just now. Get more customers. That's <laughs> <laughs> so stupid answer. <laughs> Smart ass answer. <laughs> oh, um, yeah, again, it's. It's a balance between qualitative and quantitative. So, um, you know, we're, we do the best we can with the resources available to us, um, and, and that's just it's just as simple as that, right? So, you know, the, the answer is yes. It's get more customers, so that the more customers you get, the more you're going to learn from them. And as long as you have a, a good mechanism for learning from them, both qualitatively and quantitatively, things will just get better over time. But I mean, that's it's just. You know, at the end of the day, if we have nothing, we have nothing. So, you know, we can't pull customers out of thin air. We can't pull data out of thin air. It's a, it's a process that we're going to have to go through to acquire more customers and more data. Uh, but you can learn, in my, in my experience, you can learn a lot from a few. Uh, you know, so when people are starting new ideas, like brand new, it's like interview five people that you think are the right potential user or customer. And if you interview five, let's say 10, and you don't hear any similarities in, in what they're telling you, you have a problem. But by five, you should already have patterns. You should be picking up on, they're not perfect, but they're just inklings of patterns or possibilities that are starting to give you answers. So you shouldn't need a ton of customers to be learning from. Yeah, with your experience, in rapidly growing your team, at least with the literary start. Sometimes startups can grow very quickly. Can you speak on some of the problems that you may have encountered keeping alignment across multifunctional teams in a really rapidly growing company? And I guess more importantly, how do you keep alignment when a company's growing incredibly fast? Yeah, so I don't know if everybody heard the question, but it was basically how do you just maintain alignment across rapidly growing startups? Um, and, and it's super hard, right? I mean, I, I, like, I, that's actually the answer also to every question. It's actually, it depends, and it's super hard. Um, I think the first thing, one thing you said was cross-functional teams. So you're already assuming that the teams are cross-functional, which I, I, is not always the case. I think startups often don't, well, they're cross-functional by their nature because they're really tiny, but often they silo dev and QA and design, and, like they end up getting siloed. So, if we're already cross-functional, I think we're certainly part of the way there. Okay. Um, and, and generally speaking, I would say it's it's transparency. Um, there's there's a lot of I make this mistake too, right? Uh, 
um, whether it's ego or whatever it is that, that, that gets into the mix, it's like, well, I know what to do, so just let me do my job. And that's about like the worst answer, I think, to any question. Like, why don't you just leave me alone and let me do my job? Because if someone's coming to you with a problem or they don't understand the roadmap, that's a signal that like you're not effectively communicating. So for me, it's about like insane transparency. Every roadmap is there. Every due date that we're trying to hit is there if we, if we can define them. Every scope document is there. Every metric we care about. I'm not going to force you to look at those things. But if you come to ask me what the roadmap is, I'm going to... I'm going to do this. And if you come to ask me, why are you doing that? I'm going to, right, I'll, talk, I'll be nice about it. And I'll talk to you, but I'm going to point to something that says, it's there, it was made available. I think there's other things too, like whether it's weekly emails going out about things that are going on, demo days are, I think are effective, even at the earliest stages with design. Like get designers up there or product people saying, here's what we're thinking about. Here's the problems we're trying to solve. We're going to collect some feedback. Much of it we will ignore but we'll collect it and facilitate those conversations. So I think it's just radical transparency. Great. Sure. Uh, you want, can you just stand up so we can... Sorry. Can you talk a little bit about the process you've gone through in some of your startups on identifying that one metric that really matters for you? Yeah, so um, uh, the way that you would do it is um, there's, there's sort of two things that we would, we would look at. One is the stage that we're at, and the business that we're in. And, it, and if you go to SlideShare and, and you look at the lean analytics stuff there, it, it, it'll be there, and there'll be some good examples. But those are the two things we're looking at. Like, what stage are we at? And, and in lean analytics, we, we, we define five stages. Empathy, stickiness, virality, revenue, and scale. So obviously empathy, like at the very, very beginning. So you have to figure out, really, where am I at? And then my business model, and what business I'm actually in. Whether business model, in this case, doesn't mean how do I make money necessarily. It means more um, how does a customer or a user use my product. Like think about a user journey or a user flow. And so if we can if we can have both of those, then you can kind of pinpoint. Okay, if I'm at stickiness, which means I built an MVP. I use that as my example. I built an MVP. It's early. I've got a website. Customers are coming in. You know, through some kind of acquisition. Um, they're signing free SaaS tool, they're signing up, some are converting, you know, and there's a whole bunch of other things, like I want them to pay eventually, and then I want to scale them to bigger plans, and then some drop off. There's a whole bunch of stuff that's happening. What do I really care about? At that point, I care, is anybody even using the data? So I don't care about my acquisition funnels, I don't care about the cost of acquisition, really, I don't care about my conversion rate on sign up, I need some people to show up. I really care about what's the frequency people are using. And so the one metric that matters there is going to be, well, it depends on the product, monthly active, weekly active, something like that. So it's really combining those two to try to pinpoint what matters right now to the company. Sure. So um, you mentioned that you like, I really like all this stuff, and it's something we're trying to do. But how do you balance, like, OK, I need to do these investigations, I need to make the thing, but like the dev team is coming available the resources available and we need to have work ready for them by this date. And often that's like two days from now. Yep. So how, how do you balance that or how do you make that kind of work? The now? absolute worst thing that you can do is make work for developers yeah. because they become available. Like, and I've actually, I've done that before, by the way. Like, I'm not suggesting, I, I'm, I am so far from perfect, by the way. I've done that. Like as we were, as I've scaled teams, the team gets bigger. It turns out you do, you actually end up doing less work. It's really hard. But you're like, wow, look, I've got 20 developers. Like we can do everything, right? And they're like, yeah, we're sitting here. Like, what do you want? So you have. It's, it's, it's a, but it's a disaster, right? Because yeah. if they're working on shit that doesn't matter. Then they get pissed off because they're not creating value. They're questioning why they're doing it, and you don't even have an answer for them. So you're like, just do it, right? Um, so. I think you have to just, you have to stop. The reality is, in the history of features, I don't know that there's ever been a single feature that certainly ever led to a significant sale or solved all our problems. So you're better off stopping and really taking steps. You can think about it as if you're taking steps backwards, but you're actually not, right? Like you feel like, oh, I'm going backwards to planning. But if we don't implement systems to do that, 
then we're wasting our time in the end. So I would tell developers, in, in the literal case, I would say, great guys, go refactor for shits and giggles, because we know you love refactoring. <laughs> so go refactor and fix some bugs that have been really annoying you, because you're gonna love that, and I'm gonna get my shit together so I can give you a plan that actually makes sense. And all of that work doesn't necessarily have to take a ton of time, right? Depending on the size of, of the company, right? Like design perpetual problem solution validation, roadmaps, like th this is days of work maybe, right? Even the discovery and learning, because we might not even have a lot of data, but we should at least go through the process to at least have gone through the exercise of thinking through it, even if there's gaps, like we don't really know if this is gonna work, we're not really sure what the metric is, but we're confident enough, let's try. Like it's, there's no perfect system, but that would be the answer. Go refactor some stuff for a while, let me go do this, because if we don't do this work in advance, the cost of making mistakes is just too high. Sure. Um, uh, You may just stand up. Sorry. It's okay. Yeah, I, I could tell how far I Yeah, so I'm going to be doing, I'm going to be working on a lot of new products. And um, I'm thinking about how I can think about some values uh, or some metrics that I can identify at the beginning. Like, even though later, uh, once we do have some customers, we'll be able to choose the right metrics. But is there a way that I can uh, choose metrics that I believe are important at the beginning for us to choose? monitor to track kind of the adoption rate that we think will tell us how successful we are with the rollout. Yeah, so with a new product, it's for me it's almost always usage. Some metric of usage. Now, what the right metric is will depend a great deal on the product and the frequency with which you think the product should be used. And so, but to me it's always, usage is almost always a proxy of value creation unless the usage is being 100% forced on employees and not actually creating value, which is, which is there are some products like that, right? Or, or maybe not value to that user, but someone else gets some value, right? Expense tracking, uh, or lousy expense tracking. So for me, it's always new products, new features, it's always about usage. And then the question is frequency, right? So generally speaking for me, anything over Anything beyond using something monthly is just really, you're testing the limits of what makes sense. There are obviously some products, account tax planning software would be an example of something we certainly don't use daily or weekly. We use come April or whatever when we're doing our taxes. Um, very slow cycle times, very hard to experiment, very hard to get feedback on. I would much rather we have a week, a daily use case weekly or monthly sort of at the maximum. But you have to figure out, you have to put a line in the sand that says, I think people should use this feature or this product three times a week. And how do you get that number? You can do some competitive research, you can look for proxies in the market, you can stick your finger up into the wind and make a guess. Better to have a guess um, and, then, and then go from there. But it, it's always usage at the beginning. And then later on, and that's like the lean analytics stages, you know, that's why we have stickiness, because that's all about engagement. Then there's a vi like virality, which is more about optimizing acquisition channels. Like once we know people are using it and not abandoning, then we focus on bringing more people in to see if they behave the same way. Then we focus on optimizing them. I'm just curious, in a site like a more mature product, what do you think about the role of customer success holding the entire journey and and their analytics? Yeah, I think I think it's I think it's um, super important, and I think customer success. I think of product. You know, to some extent, I think I visualize it as product holding the whole. You know, holding the bag on on everything. But I, I, you, in a more mature organization, you could absolutely put customer success there. Managing inputs to some to some degree, right, from customers and feedback, uh, providing um, uh, tracking metrics that really matter, like things like churn, right, because that's that's where it's going to lie. Like customer success in a more mature company, it's like make sure they don't churn. And, and sophisticated organizations will see they'll have leading indicators in advance of churn that they know that company's churning, and then they put customer success on it. So I think that's a good example. Like customer success is is definitely. Just to that end, 
an analyst that would actually mine that book, what do, you, what do you look for in terms of a skill set and a person for, for that type of role? For mining the data? Well, and, and holding that journey and saying, you're going to turn here, you're going to... Well, I, I think there's a couple of things there, right? Like customer success for me, part of it is like obviously customer facing. So it can't. It has to be somebody who can speak to other humans. So that's sort of like that. That would be one role there. I think the analyst role is really somebody who can get down to understanding the data and communicating it simply. So you know they can dig in and, and dig into the weeds and look for those complicated relationships and patterns, but then effectively communicate that. Uh, I would you know, and I think some people who do the data analyst side are great at just analyzing the data. Some are good at thinking about the problems. So the closer we can get, I would argue, and there, I, I, I would argue that the closer we can get everybody in a company to the customer, the better off we are. So if we have customer success and we have the person who talks to the customer and the person who does the data and they're like this, we're in trouble. If we can get the data person doing some customer support, sitting in on meetings, hearing problems and saying, Okay, I understand that problem. Let me go look in the data and see if I can understand what's going on. That, that's what we need. There's people who can be close. They don't have to be super personable, but we need them close from an organizational perspective. Okay. You haven't talked much about it tonight, but I think baby testing and multivariate testing can be also super important tools that are very analytics focused. If you have a clear idea of a particular behavior or, or function that you're trying to make some changes to. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, we didn't go into a lot on the tactic side or even like how to define an MVP and those kinds of things, like what feature set do we really try to build and how do we test it? But A-B testing, certainly uh, very valuable. Uh, multivariate testing as well. I, I mentioned cohort analysis sort of flippantly. Uh, I'm happy to talk about that. But yeah, I mean, there's lots of ways of experimenting with things. Um, and that actually might be, a, you know, an element of an answer for the question you asked, how do I get away with doing things? It's like, let's just test something on the side. Now, uh, there is a risk that we get into a culture of testing everything, which is like the opposite problem maybe of what you have, but there are companies like that, that they're like, literally nobody can now make a decision unless we test it. And now you've taken the creativity and the, the spirit out of product development, which I, I don't think we can eliminate because we're not robots. But yeah, maybe testing certainly an easy relatively easy way of testing things out and getting permission to do things. Yeah, I, now I, I, yeah. <laughs> I can't say what I was, what I'm going to say because I, you, I heard you, I overheard you where you were. So, um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, how how do we convince people the sky is blue? I don't know. Like, if you don't believe the sky is blue, we have other problems. If I'm just being completely honest, right? Like, um, I don't know what kind of budget you're specifically talking. You know, like how much are we talking about? Like, these things are getting cheaper and cheaper to do. So I would argue that, here's the way I would think about it. What are the costs if we don't do it? How do we, and they're very hard to measure, right? But how, if we were to even scribble on a whiteboard the cost of making a mistake and launching something that's wrong, what would that cost? Let's look at the man hours, just for not exact, I don't need timesheets. Let's just look, how long did it take to build that feature? You know, how long did it take to plan it? How many people were involved in the meetings to, to do that? Oh, what was the result? Oh yeah, nobody used that. So what did that cost us? Like in, in salaries, let's just do, you know. So to me, the, the answer at the end of the day is how can we afford not to test at least some things? Because how many times, and I've made this mistake many times, but how many times have we released things that just were bad? They were just wrong. You know, they may work, and, but like wrong target, wrong feature, wrong timing. And so I just don't know how people could argue against, you know, the investment up front to save money later on. But it, you just pick some examples and, and you know, they're, they're painful, right? Like, oh, we spent six months building this new thing, we launched it, and it completely flopped. What did that cost? Oh, a million dollars. What if we had A-B tested something at the beginning and realized we didn't know what we were talking about? Like, would it cost us $10 to not have spent a million dollars? Right? That's the way I would approach it. Oh, by, by way of testimonial, 
I only wish I'd read your book 10 years ago. It changed our world. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate I, that. As a senior stakeholder, there was nothing better than taking out the end. That's great. Yeah. If you build a hardware product and it's not Yeah, there's always somebody in the audience that's a hardware person, by the way. Always a hardware person. There's always one. It's like, this doesn't... Yeah, so the, the answer is, the answer is it's just much... So the question was, if I'm doing hardware and it's not connected, um, so we have no way of getting data from the device, right? Yeah, so then at the end of the day, most of the information you're going to get is going to be qualitative. Right? Now, I think there's probably creative ways of thinking about, like, and there may be slightly more analytical tools like surveying, because they're existing customers, so we should know what questions we want to ask them. So we could probably do some surveying. Um, we might want to think about connecting the devices if we can, or adding value beyond the hardware that is online, and we can use that as a proxy. Like, you know, what I don't even know what that would be, but. Does it make sense to make the device just for the sake of trying to get that from the user, from the uh, I think it, it would, it would I, my, my first reaction is yes, because it's like, it, it, but it depends on the business, right? So like, if you're selling these, nobody cares, right? So like, whoever buys these, we buy them, we don't buy very many of them, nobody, you know, these guys don't care if you use it that often, thank you very much, bought it, Michael, done, right? So if you're in that business of selling widgets, nobody cares. If you're in the business of selling a widget and you want to sell them a second widget, if they use the first one, or you want, you know, then I think connecting the device to understand the value that it's creating matters. But I think it in part will depend on, on the device itself or, or, or the product itself. Because uh, like these, I doubt these guys care. Because right? they know, I'm gonna sell this many microphones, this, like it's very, it's just, you know, any other questions? Cool. All right. Well, thank you very much, guys.